and he's now embarked on an IoT startup called Sound Sensing. Uh, today, he'll talk to us about a topic related to his thesis, audio classification with machine learning. Hi, thank you. So um, audio classification is not such a popular topic as, for instance, uh, image classification or natural language processing. So I'm happy to see that there's still people in the room uh, interested in this uh, topic. Um, so first, um, and this um, about me, I'm an Internet of Things specialist. I have background in electronics from uh, nine years ago. Worked a lot as a software engineer, because electronics is mostly software these days, or a lot of software. And then I uh, went to do a master's in data science, because uh, IoT, to me, is the combination of electronics, sensors especially, um, software, you need to process the data, uh, and the data itself. You need to somehow convert sensor data into information that is useful. And, and now I'm consulting on INT and machine learning, and I'm also the CTO of sound sensing. We deliver uh, sensor units for noise monitoring. In this talk, my goal, we'll see if we get there, is that you as a machine learning practitioner, without necessarily prior experience in sound processing, can solve a basic audio classification problem. Uh, we'll have an introduction about a little bit of sound, very briefly, um, and then we'll go through a basic audio classification pipeline, and uh, then some tips and tricks for how to kind of go a little bit beyond that basic, and then I'll give some pointers to more information. Uh, the slides and a lot of my notes on machine hearing in general, a little bit, little bit broader than audio classification, is on this uh, GitHub. So applications. Uh, there are some very well recognized subfields of audio. Uh, speech recognition is one of them. And for instance, there you have, a, as a classification task, you have keyword spotting. So hey Siri uh, or hey, hey Google um, as, a, as a task. In music analysis, you also have uh, many tasks uh, of genre classification, for instance, can be seen as a, a simple audio classification task. Uh, but we're going to keep it mostly on the general level, so we're not going to use like a lot of uh, speech or music-specific uh, uh, domain knowledge. And we still have uh, also examples in uh, across a wide range of things. I mean, anything you can do with hearing uh, as a human, you, we can get close to, or uh, many at least in classification tasks uh, with with machines today. So in acoustics, you might want to an analyze uh, bird migrations using sensor data to see their patterns. You might want to detect poachers in protected areas to make sure that no one actually is going around shooting um, where there should be no uh, guns fired and so on. Um, so using quality control in manufacturing, especially because you, can, you don't have to uh, uh, go into the equipment uh, or the product under test. You can listen to it from the outside. For instance, used for testing uh, your electrical car seats that uh, they, the all motors run. Um, in security, it's used to help uh, uh, monitor large amounts of CCTVs uh, by also analyzing audio. And in medical, for instance, you could uh, detect uh, heart murmurs, which is a, uh, could be indicative of a heart condition. So these are some motivating examples. And, uh, So in digital sound, I'll just go very briefly through this. Um, first thing to, that is important is that sound is almost always, or basically always a mixture. Because sound, I mean, uh, it, 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 uh, it will move around the corner, unlike uh, uh, image, for instance. And you'll always have sound coming from else. It will also uh, transport in the, in the ground and be reflected by a wall. And all these things make it so you always have multiple sound sources, or the source of interest, and then always other uh, sound sources. Um, in audio acquisition, OK, we have, of course, sound is, a, um, is air pressure. We need to go have a microphone converted to electrical voltage, ADC, and then we have a digital waveform, which is what we will deal with. Uh, then it's quantized in time, uh, for instance, with the sampling rate and in amplitude. And we usually deal with mono, primarily with mono, when we do audio classification still. There are some methods around stereo, but not widely adopted. And also multi-channel, you could also have. We typically use uncompressed formats. It's just the, the safest. Um, although you, in real life situation, you might also have uh, compressed uh, uh, data, which can uh, have artifacts and so on that might influence your, your model. 
Um, so we can, after we have a waveform, we can convert it into a spectrogram. And this, in practice, is a very useful representation, both for, as a human, for understanding what is the sound, and for the machines. To, uh, in order to do detection on this. So this one is uh, a frog croaking, like grrrk, 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 very periodically. You see a little gap. Uh, and then it's hard to see, but in, t in top, in the higher level, there is some uh, cicadas that are, are going as well. So um, and this allows us to both see the few frequency representation and the patterns across time. And together, you can often, uh, this, this allows you to separate uh, uh, different uh, sound sources from your mixture. So we'll go through a practical example just to keep it um, kind of uh, hands-on. Uh, environmental sound classification. So give an audio signal of environmental sounds. So these are everyday sounds that are around in the environment. For instance, uh, it can be uh, out outdoors, uh, cars, um, children playing, and so on. It's very widely researched. We have several open data sets that are, that are yeah, uh, quite good. Um, audio set is, uh, is uh, several, uh, I think, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of samples. And in 2017, we reached uh, roughly human level performance. Uh, only one of these uh, data sets has an estimate for what is human level performance, but we seem to have uh, surpassed that now. Um, and one nice data set is Urban Sound 8K, which has 10 classes of uh, 8K samples. They're roughly four seconds long and nine hours total. And state of the art here is uh, around 80%, so 79 to 82 uh, accuracy. So how to, like, so in this, yeah, now we have uh, spectrograms, and these are the, the easy samples. This uh, data set has many challenging samples where uh, the sound of interest is very far away and, and hard to detect. Um, and these ones are easy, so you see the siren goes like woo, 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 uh, very up and down and uh, jackhammers and drilling have very periodic patterns. So how can we detect this um, using um, a machine learning algorithm in order to output these classes? So I will get through a basic audio pipeline, uh, skipping around like 30 to 100 years of, of history of audio processing, kind of going straight to what is now the, the typical way of doing things. Uh, and it looks something like this. So, first in the in the input we have our we have our audio stream. So it's important to realize that, of course, audio has time related to it. So it's more like a video than, than to an image. And in a in a practical scenario, might you do real time classification? So this might be a uh, infinite uh, stream that just uh, goes on and on. So it's important. Um, for that reason, and for also the machine learning algorithm, to divide this stream into small uh, or uh, relatively small uh, analysis windows that you will actually process. And um, however, you often have the mismatch between uh, how often you have labels for your data versus how often you actually want a prediction. Uh, it's known as weak labeling. I won't go much into it, but. Um, so in the urban sound, there's four, so four seconds uh, sound snippets. So that's what kind of what we're given in this curated data set. However, it's usually beneficial to use smaller analysis windows uh, to reduce the dimensionality of the machine learning algorithm. So um, the process goes that we will divide the audio um, into these uh, segments. It will often use uh, overlap. And then we'll convert it into a spectrogram. We'll use a particular a type of spectrogram called a MEL spectrogram, which has been shown to work well. And then we'll pass that frame uh, of, or, of features from the spectrogram into our classifier, and it will output uh, the cl uh, classification for that small time window. And then, uh, because we have labels per four seconds, we'll need to do um, an aggregation in order to come up with the, the final prediction for this four seconds, not just for this one little window. Uh, we'll go through these steps now. So first analysis windows. I mentioned we often use uh, overlap. Um, so this is somewhat specified in two different ways. One is an overlap percentage. Here we have 50% uh, overlap. So that means that we're essentially classifying parts of the, or we're, we're classifying 
every piece of the auto stream twice. So if we have even more overlap, we will maybe 90% overlap, then we're classifying it 10 times. Um, and that gives the algorithm a kind of multiple viewpoints on, on, on this audio stream and uh, makes it easier to catch um, uh, the sounds of interest because uh, the model might, uh, uh, in training, might have been kind of prefer a certain sound to appear in a certain position inside this analysis window. So overlap is a good uh, way of, of, uh, of uh, working with that. So um, I mentioned we used a specific type of um, spectrogram. Um, so the spectrogram is usually processed with those called MEL uh, scale filters. These um, are inspired by the human hearing. So we are, our ability to differentiate uh, sounds of different frequencies uh, reduce, is reduced as frequencies get higher. So uh, low sounds, we're able to detect uh, small uh, frequency variations. Um, however, for uh, high-pitched sounds, we need large frequency variations to work. And uh, by using this kind of um, uh, filters on, on the spectrogram, uh, we obtain a representation is sim more similar to our ears, but uh, more importantly, it's, it's, it's a smaller representation for a machine learning model. And it captures, and also you, um, you'll, you'll be able to merge um, kind of related data in, 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 in two consecutive bins, for instance. So when you've done that, it looks uh, something like, like this. So the top is a normal spectrogram. Uh, you see kind of a lot of small details. The bottom one, we've, uh, we've uh, started the MEL filters at 1,000 hertz. So this is bird audio, so it's quite high-pitched. A um, lot of uh, chirps up and down. And in the th uh, third one, we've, we've uh, normalized the data. And we usually use um, log-scale compression and um, in order to, because sound has a very large dynamic range. So uh, sounds that are faint uh, versus sounds that are very loud for the human ear is a uh, factor of 1,000 or factor of 10,000 in energy difference. Um, so when you've normalized, uh, log-scaled, uh, applied mel spectrogram and normalized, you look at something like the uh, image below there. Uh, so in Python, uh, this feature processing is something like this. I'm not going to go through all the <coughs> code in detail. Um, we have an excellent uh, library called Librosa, which is great for uh, uh, just loading, loading the data and doing basic feature preprocessing. Also, some, um, some of the deep learning frameworks have their own um, metal spectrogram implementations that you may also use, but this is a general uh, thing. Um, in streaming, so when people uh, analyze uh, audio, they often apply normalization uh, learned from the, the mean, for instance, across their whole um, samples, four seconds in, in, in this case, or from their whole data set. Um, that's, uh, that can be hard to, uh, to apply uh, when you have a continuous audio stream, which is, has, for instance, changing volume and so on. So, um, so what we usually do is we normalize per frame. So the, the, the hope is that you have enough information in our roughly one second of da data in order to do a, a decent normalization. Uh, and doing normalization like this has some interesting uh, consequences when, when, uh, when there is no input. Because uh, what happens is if you have no input to your, your um, uh, feature processor, you're going to blow up all the noise. So you, you'll sometimes need to... Uh, exclude very low um, energy signals from being, from being uh, classified. It's just like a little practical tip. Um, so convolutional neural networks, they're, they're hot. Uh, who here has uh, basic familiarity, at least uh, gone through a tutorial or read a blog post about image classification and CNNs? Yeah, that's quite, that's quite a, a few. So CNNs are the best in class for image classifications. And spectrograms are image-like, and they, they are 2D representation. Um, they have some differences. So the question is, or maybe it was, is will CNNs work well on spectrograms? Because that would be interesting. And the answer is yes. This has been researched quite, uh, quite a lot. And this is great because uh, there is a lot of uh, tools, knowledge, uh, experience, 
um, and pre-trained models uh, for image classification. So being able to reuse those in the auto domain, which is not such a big field, uh, is a major, um, major uh, win. So you'll see a lot of the research lately. Is it, it, it can be a little bit boring in audio classification research because a lot of it is like taking one year ago <laughs> image uh, classifying tools and applying them and seeing whether it works. Mm. It is, however, a little bit surprising that this actually works because the spectrogram has uh, frequency on the y-axis, typically, uh, as shown that way, and time on the other axis. So movement um, or a scaling um, in this uh, this space doesn't mean the same as in an image. You know, in an image, if I have my face inside an image, it doesn't matter where my face appears. If you have a spectrogram and you have a certain sound, maybe it's like a ch uh, chirp, uh, up and down, if you move that up in frequency or down, uh, at least if you move it a lot, it's, it's probably not the same sound anymore. Um, it might go from a human talking to a bird. Um, based, the shape is, might be similar, but the position matters. So it's a little bit surprising that this works, but it, it, it does seem to do really well in practice. So um, this is one um, model uh, that does well on urban sound. And uh, one thing you'll note compared to a lot of image models is that it's, it's quite simple. I mean, it's, it, uh, relatively few layers. This is smaller than or same size, size as, uh, as a LeanNet. Um, and there are three convolutional blocks followed by Mac uh, with max pooling between the two first blocks. And that's, uh, you know, the, the standard uh, kind of architecture. Uh, using This one using 5x5 five five instead of 2x3 kernels doesn't make much of a difference. You could stack another layer and do the same thing. Um, and we flatten and we use a fully convolutional and so this is from 2016 and still is one of, is like close to state of the art on this uh, on this data set urban sound 8k so if you are training uh, cnn from scratch on audio data do start with a simple model i mean don't there's no there is usually no reason to start with say vgg 16 with 16 layers and millions of parameters or even mobile net or something like that you can usually go quite far with with this kind of simple architecture, a couple of convolutional uh, layers. So in, in, in Keras, uh, for example, this could look something like this, uh, where we have our individual uh, kind of blocks, convolution, max pooling, uh, rarely known linearity, same for the second one, and our full, uh, classification at the end, full connected layers. Uh, so um, yes, and then like so, this is our classifier. We'll, we'll pass the classification through this, and it will give you us a prediction for which class uh, it was. Uh, so ten classes in the urban sound, and then uh, for each window, and then we need to aggregate these individual windows. And there are multiple ways of doing this. You could do the simplest kind of uh, thing to think about is to do uh, majority voting. So if we have uh, ten windows of our four second uh, spectrum. Um, we could uh, do the predictions on each and then just say, okay, the majority uh, class wins. Um, that works uh, rather well. Um, it's uh, not uh, differentiable, uh, and so you kind of need to do this post-processing. So, in, and you're kind of, you're, you're making very rough predictions on each, on each step. So uh, mean, um, mean pooling or global average pooling across uh, those uh, analysis windows usually does uh, a little bit better. And it's nice with deep learning frameworks is that you can also uh, have this as a layer. So for instance, in Keras, you have the time distributed layer, uh, which is there's sadly extremely few examples of online. So it took me, a, like, it's not that hard to use, but uh, it took me a little to, to figure out how to do it. And so we apply a base model, which is in this case the input to this function. Uh, we pass it to the time distributed um, layer, and uh, which essentially, uh, it will uh, it will use a single instance of your model, so it will share the weights for all these uh, f uh, steps in the or all the analysis windows, um, and then if, so we'll just run it multiple times when you do the prediction step, and then it will global average pooling uh, over these predictions. Um, so here we're we're uh, averaging the predictions. You can also um, you can also uh, do more advanced things where you would. Um, for instance, average your uh, feature representation and then do a more advanced classifier on top of this. But uh, this is called probabilistic voting. Um, 
quite often uh, in other literature when you do this mean uh, mean pooling. Uh, yes, so that, that allows us, so this will give us a new model, uh, which is what will then take not uh, single in, uh, analysis windows, but will take a set of analysis windows, typically in, or corresponding to our four seconds with, for example, 10 windows. So um, if you do this, and a um, couple of more uh, uh, tricks uh, from my uh, thesis, you can have a system working something like this. So this has, uh, in addition to building model and so on, which I've gone through, um, we're also deploying to a small microcontroller um, using the vendor-provided tools that converts to Keras model and so on. So that's kind of roughly standard things. I didn't want to go into it here. So a uh, little demo video. Let's see how that, if we have a sound. So here are the 10 classes. And uh, we have various sound samples. This is uh, children playing, I think in Spain, since they said hola. And what we do also here is we threshold um, uh, the prediction. So if, if no prediction is good, we'll consider it unknown. And this is also important in practice, because sometimes you have out-of-class data. It's drilling, or this, actually the, the sample I found said jackhammer. And jackhammer is also a class in drilling. They are, to my ear, uh, hard to distinguish sometimes, and the, the model can also struggle with that. There's a dog barking. And so in this case, all the classification happens on the small uh, sensor unit, which is what I focus on in my, in my thesis. Oh, there's a siren a little bit louder. And actually, it didn't get the first part of the siren, this doo 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 doo, only this undulating uh, sound uh, later. So this, and, but actually these samples are, from, uh, are not from the urban sound data set, which I've trained on, so they're out of the main samples, which is generally a much more challenging, uh, challenging task. Uh, yes, so that's it for the demo. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, doing sound classifications on these sensor units, very small, you can uh, get my, my, my full thesis. The, both the report and the code is on GitHub. It's also linked from the machine uh, hearing uh, uh, repository, uh, yes. So I won't go into much, much details there. And some uh, tips and tricks. So we've we've covered the basic audio uh, processing pipeline, a, mo a modern one, and that will give you uh, results and generally quite good results with a modern uh, uh, CNN architecture. And there, but there are some tips and tricks, especially in practice, where uh, when you are you have a new problem, you're not researching an existing data set, your data sets are usually much smaller and it's quite costly and, and, and tedious to annotate all the data and so on. So uh, there are some tricks for that. Uh, first one is data augmentation. This is well known from, from other um, deep learning applications, especially image processing. And data augmentation can be done on audio, can be done either in the time domain or in the spectrogram domain. And in, in practice, it, it both seem to work, uh, work fine. Um, so here are some examples of common, um, common augmentations. The most uh, common and possibly most important is to do uh, time shifting. So remember that I said that um, in the, in, when you classify an analysis window, maybe one second, you know, the sounds of interest there or in, in what the individual convolution kernel sees what might be very short. If you have bird chirps, they're like, and those are, you know, maybe 100 milliseconds max, or maybe even 10 milliseconds. So they, they occupy very little space in that image that the classifier sees. And, um, but it's important that it's able to classify it no matter, or it's desirable that it's able to classify it no matter where inside this uh, analysis window it appears. So time shifting uh, simply means that you, you do, uh, you, you shift your samples uh, in time, left and uh, forward and backward, left and right. Um, and that gives then, you know, the algorithm has seen that, oh, okay, bird chirps can appear, you know, many places in time, any place in time, and it doesn't uh, make a difference to the classification. So this is the, by far the most important uh, one. And you can usually go quite far with just time shifting. Um, if you do want precise location of your, um, of your uh, event, so you wanna have a classifier that can tell when did chirps appear, not just uh, in the 100 millisecond range, instead of 
uh, just that there was birds in this four or 10 second audio, then you might not want to do uh, time shifting because uh, you might want to have kind of that the sound always occurs in the middle of the window. But then you need to, uh, your labeling needs to, to, uh, to respect that. Um, yeah, time stretching, so many sounds, you know, if I speak slowly or I speak very fast, it's, it's the same, you know, it's the same meaning, it's the same, uh, it's certainly the same class, it's both speech. So time stretching is also very, uh, very efficient to, to capture such uh, variations and also pitch shifting. Uh, so if, if I'm speaking with a low voice or a high pitched voice, you know, it's still the same kind of information and the same carries in, in you know, for general sounds, uh, at least a little bit. So a little bit of time shift, you, uh, a pitch shift you can expect, but a lot of pitch shift uh, might kind of bring you into new class. For instance, the difference between uh, uh, human uh, speech and, uh, and uh, bird chirps. It might, that might be a big uh, pitch shift, so, so you might wanna limit how much you're pitch shifting. So typical uh, data imitation settings here is like maybe 10 to 20% on time shift and uh, pitch shift. You can also add noise. This is uh, also quite efficient, uh, especially if you, if you do know that you have variable amount of noise. Uh, random noise works okay. You can also uh, sample. There's like a lot of repositories of, of basically noise where you'll, you'll mix in noise with your signal and uh, classify that. Uh, mix up is an interesting um, data augmentation strategy that mixes two samples um, like by a linear combination of the two and actually adjusts the labels accordingly. And that has been shown to work really well also in combination with other augmentation techniques on audio. So, um, yes, we can basically apply CNNs uh, with the standard kind of image type architecture. This means that we can do transfer learning from image data. So, of course, image data has, I mean, is significantly different from, from spectrograms. I mentioned the frequency axis and so on. However, the, some of the base operations that are needed, you need to detect edges, you need to detect diagonals, you need to detect uh, uh, patterns of edges and diagonals, you need to detect kind of a, a, a blob um, of area. Those are common. Uh, kind of functionality needed by both. So uh, if, you're do, if, if you do want to use a bigger model, uh, definitely uh, try to use a pre-trained uh, model and fine tune it. Uh, for instance, most deep learning frameworks, including Keras, have pre-trained models, pre-trained on the image net. Uh, the thing is that most of these models, they apply, um, take RGB color Im images as data, and it, 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 can, it can work to just like use one of those uh, channels. Um, and zero fill the other ones, uh, but you can also use, uh, uh, just copy the data and cross the three. Uh, there's also some papers showing that you can do multi-scale. So for instance, uh, one has a spectrogram with very um, fine time resolution, and one has a, one with a very coarse time resolution. And then you put them in different channels, and this can, can be uh, beneficial. Um, but because uh, image data and sound data are quite different, you usually do need to fine tune. So it's usually not enough to just apply a pre-trained model and then just uh, tune the, the, the classifier at the end. Uh, you do need to tune a couple of uh, layers at the end and typically also the first layer at least. Sometimes you fine tune the whole thing. But it, it is generally uh, uh, very beneficial. So definitely if you have a smaller data set and you need that high performance and you can't get it with a small model, go with a pre-trained model, for instance, mobile net or something like that, and then uh, fine tune it. Uh, audio embeddings is another, is another uh, strategy um, inspired by text embeddings where you uh, create a, um, for instance, 128 dimensional uh, vector from, um, from your text data. You can do the same with the image, uh, with sound. So um, with the look, listen, learn, so L, L3, you can convert a one second audio uh, spectrogram into a 512 dimensional vector, which has, a, uh, which has been trained on uh, millions of YouTube videos. So it's, it's seen like a very large amount of uh, different sounds. Um, and that uses a CNN under the hood and basically gives you that, that uh, very compressed uh, uh, vector um, as a classification. 
and I didn't finish any code sample here, but there's a very nice, um, the latest work is uh, uh, from OpenL3, uh, L3, uh, from Look, Listen, More is the paper, and they have a Python package which makes it super simple, just um, import it, it's one function to uh, pre-process, and then you can classify uh, audio basically just with a linear uh, classifier from scikit-learn or so on. So that if you don't have any deep learning experience and you want to you try an audio classification problem, definitely go this route first, because this will uh, handle kind of the, will basically handle the audio part for you and you'll, you'll just, you can apply a simple, uh, simple uh, classifier after that. Um, one little tip, I mean, you might want to do your own data set, right? Um, Audacity is a nice uh, editor uh, for, um, for uh, audio, and it has a, a nice support for annotating, uh, adding a label track and annotating. There's, command, there's like keyboard shortcuts for, uh, uh, for all the functions that you need, so it's quite quick to, to, um, to use. So here I'm annotating some, uh, some customer data where we did uh, event recognition. Um, and the nice thing is that the format that they have is, is basically a CSV file, it has no header and, and so on, but, uh, but uh, this uh, pandas uh, line will basically give you a nice data frame with uh, all your annotations from the sound. Uh, yes, so it's time to, uh, to summarize. Oh, I have a fix me. Okay, so we went through the basic audio uh, pipeline. Um, we split the audio into fixed length analysis windows. We used log melt spectrogram as a feature representation because it's shown to work very well. We then applied a uh, machine learning model, typically a convolutional neural network, and then we aggregated the predictions from um, each individual window and we uh, uh, merged them together using global mean pooling. Um, and uh, models that are, I would recommend trying first, if you're trying some new data, try audio embeddings with OpenL3 and a simple uh, model like a linear classifier or, uh, um, or a random forest, for instance. Um, uh, try a convolutional neural network using transfer learning. It's quite uh, powerful and there are usually examples that will get you pretty far. Uh, if you do, for instance, pre-process your spectrograms, and save them as PNG files. Uh, basically, you can kind of take any <laughs> image classification pipeline that you have already, or uh, um, uh, if, you, if you're willing to um, uh, kind of ignore this uh, merging of, uh, of different analysis windows, um, and, and, and use that. Data augmentation is very effective. Time shift, uh, time stretch, pitch shift, noise add are basically uh, recommended uh, to use. Sadly, there's not such nice, like, or like go-to uh, implementations of these in, in, for instance, Keras generators, but it's not, not that hard to, to do. It's just, yeah. uh, yes, some more learning resources uh, for you, the slides, and also a lot of my notes in general uh, are on, uh, on this GitHub. Um, if you do want to get hands-on experience, uh, TensorFlow has a pretty nice tutorial uh, called Simple Audio Recognition, uh, and it's, uh, it's about uh, recognizing speech commands, which could be interesting uh, in general, but it's, it's taking a general approach. It's not speech specific, so you can use it for uh, other things also. Um, uh, there's one book recommendation, Computational Analysis of Sound Scene and Events. It's quite thorough when it comes to general audio classification, a very modern book from 2018. Uh, so that's a nice one also. So, I think we have questions maybe? We have 10 minutes for questions, so uh, please go to the microphones in the aisles to ask them. I think our first is there. Yeah, thanks, John. Very interesting application of machine learning. Um, I have two questions, small questions. So there's obviously a, like a time series component to your data. Um, I'm not so familiar with this audio classification problem, but are, can you tell us a bit about uh, time series methods, maybe LSTM and so on, how successful they are? Yes. Um, yeah, time series is, uh, intuitively, one would really want to apply that because there is definitely a time component. Um, so convolutional recurrent neural networks uh, do quite well uh, when you're looking at longer time scales. For instance, there's a classification task called audio scene recognition. For instance, right, I have a 10 or maybe 30 second clip. Is this from a restaurant or from a city and so on? And there you see that uh, the recurrent networks that do 
have a much stronger time uh, um, modeling, they do better. Uh, but for small, short tasks, the CNNs do just fine, surprisingly. Okay. And the other small question I had was, um, just to understand your label, the target that it's, it's learning, um, you said that this is all, all very mixed, the sound is a very, very mixed uh, uh, data set, so um, are the labels just like one category of sound when you're learning, or would it be beneficial to have, you know, maybe a weighted set of two categories when doing learning? Yeah, so in an audio classification task, the typical is to have, or kind of by definition, is to have a single label. Um, on a, 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 a some sort of window of time, um, uh, you ha can have multi-label uh, data sets, of course, and in, in practice, that's a more realistic modeling of the world because you basically always have multiple sounds. Um, so I think AudioSet has um, multi-labeling, and there's a new urban uh, sound uh, data set now that also has multiple labels, and then you apply uh, uh, like kind of more uh, tagging approaches, and but uh, class. You're using classification as a as a base, so I had uh, uh, with tagging. It's, you can either use a separate classifier per track or sound of interest, um, or you can have a joint m uh, model which has multi-label classification. So definitely, this is uh, something that uh, you'd want to do, but it does complicate the <laughs> the, uh, the the problem. We have over there one person in the mic. And you mentioned about data augmentation that we can also mix up to separate uh, our cases into yes. the, and mix them. And then the label of that mix up should be like uh, weighted also because it kind of concludes with previous question. Yes. Should be like 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 for the other and how will that work? Yes, so uh, mix up is, um, it was proposed uh, I think like two, three years ago. There's a general method. Um, so you basically take your uh, sound with your, with your target class and you say, okay, let's take 80% of that, not 100, oh. and then take 20% of some other sound, which is a non-target class, mix it together, and then update the labels accordingly. So it's kind of just telling you, hey, there is, we're, we're basically creating um, a lot of, uh, there is this predominant sound, but there's also this sound in the background. Okay, thank you. Yes, we have a question. Um, you mentioned about the male frequency ranges, uh, but usually when you record audio via microphones, you get up to 20,000 hertz. Yes. So have you any experience or could you comment on uh, when you have added information of the higher frequency ranges, does that affect the uh, machine learning algorithm or uh, yes. other features that one could use? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, typically recordings are done at 44 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz for general audio. Um, Often machine learning is applied at lower frequencies, so with the tw uh, 22 kilohertz, or sometimes even just 16, or in, in the rare case, it's also eight. So it, gets, it depends on the, on the sounds of interest. Uh, if you're doing birds, definitely you want to keep that high, those high frequency things. Uh, if you're doing speech, you can do just fine on the eight kilohertz usually. Um, another thing is that um, noise tends to be in the lower areas of, of the spectrum. There's more energy in the lower end of the spectrum. So if you are doing birds, you might want to just ignore everything below one kilohertz, for instance. And that definitely simplifies your model, especially if you have a small data set. Yes, uh, we have more questions. You need to go to the mic, either here or there. Uh, quick question. You mentioned the editor that has support for uh, annotating audio, could you please repeat the name? Yes, Audacity. Audacity, okay. Yes. And, and, and more general question, do you have any tips uh, if, for example, you are, don't have an existing data set and just starting with a bunch of audio that you want to annotate first, do, do you have any advice for the strategies like some, maybe semi-supervised learning or something like this? Uh, yeah, semi-supervised is very interesting. It, it, there's a lot of papers, but I haven't seen like very good like practical methodology f for it. And I think in general, uh, annotating a data set is it like a whole other talk. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very interested to come and uh, chat about uh, this, uh, this later. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, we have two more and I think we're done. Very nice talk. Uh, my question would be, do you have to deal with any pre-processing or like white noise filtering? 
Uh, you mean to remove white noise? It's exactly, because um, you, just, uh, you just said like removing or ignoring certain amount of yes. frequencies. That are um, on the you, lower part. You, you can. Um, I mean, scoping the, your frequency range definitely is, is very easy. So just like, just do it if you if you know where your uh, things of interest are. Um, denoising, you can apply a separate denoising step beforehand and then do machine learning. Um, if you don't have a lot of data, that can be very beneficial. For instance, maybe you can use a standard denoising algorithm trained on like thousands of, of hours of stuff or just a general DSP method. Um, if you have a lot of data, then in practice, uh, the machine learning algorithm itself learns to suppress the noise. Uh, but, but it only works if you have a lot of data. So thank you for your talk. Uh, is it possible to train a deep convo convolutional uh, neural net directly on uh, the time domain uh, data using uh, 1D convolutions and deleted convolutions and stuff like this? Yes, this is possible, and it is uh, very actively researched. So it's only, but it's only within the last like year or two that they are getting to the same level of performance as spectrogram-based models. Um, but some models now are showing uh, actually better performance with the end-to-end -end trained uh, model. So this, I, I, I expect that, you know, in a couple of years, maybe that will be the, the, the kind of go-to for a practical application. Uh, can I do a speech recognition with this? Um, this is only like uh, six classes, like, uh, and I, I think you have uh, much more classes if you want to uh, <laughs> yes. classify words. If you want to do automatic speech recognition, so the complete uh, vocabulary of, of, of English, for instance, then you, 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 you can theoretically, but there are specific models for uh, automatic speech recognition that will, in general, do, uh, do better. So, so if you want full speech recognition, uh, you should look at spe uh, speech-specific methods. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are many available. So, but if you're doing a simple task like uh, commands, like uh, yes, no, up, down, one, two, three, four, five, where you can limit your vocabulary to say maybe under the hundred classes or something, mm -hmm. then it gets much more realistic to apply a kind of speech unaware uh, model like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for an interesting presentation. I was just wondering, from, from the thesis, it looks like you uh, uh, applied this uh, model to a microprocessor. Can yes. you tell a little bit about the framework you use where you transferred it from a Python? Uh, yes, so we, we used the vendor provided library from uh, STM uh, Microelectronics for the STM32, and it's called Xcube AI. Um, you'll find links in the, in the GitHub. Um, it's a proprietary solution, only works on the microcontroller, but it's, it, you just, it's very simple. You plug in your, you, you throw in the Keras model, it will give you a C model uh, out, and they have examples about the pre-processing uh, with some bugs, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it does work. And the, the firmware code is also in the GitHub repository, not just the model, so you can basically download that and, and, and start going. Okay, yeah, do uh, join uh, me here if you want to talk more about some specific thing about auto classification. I'll also be around this, this day. Thank you. Thank you, John Nordby.